The F-4 Phantom is an aircraft now ubiquitous within the common consciousness as an iconic fighter of the Cold War. But the Phantom's dominance as America's universal high-performance fighter was not always guaranteed. One aircraft in particular posed a threat to the Phantom at sea, a carrier-based fighter which is faster, lighter, and more maneuverable, the F-8U-3, Crusader III, or the Super Crusader. Based on the F-8 Crusader, a well-performing carrier-based fighter aircraft, the new Crusader was a different beast entirely. Bigger, and with a more powerful engine and those unmistakable ventral fins, the aircraft's mean, sleek appearance matches perfectly with its performance. First becoming airborne on June 2, 1958, the Super Crusader was capable of continued flight faster than the F-4H's maximum speed, performing sustained Mach 2.2 flight at 68,000 feet and with a maximum speed of Mach 2.39. To achieve this speed, the Crusader III used the J75P-5 turbojet engine, which produced an immense 26,000 pounds of thrust. This massively powerful engine not only gave the aircraft incredible speed, but also acceleration and superb climb rate. Donald L. Malik, author of The Smell of Kerosene, and a test pilot of the FAU-3, recalls how incredible the performance of the aircraft was. I can remember the response of one GCI controller, as he followed my track north and I quickly accelerated to Mach 2. Sir, he asked, what in the hell are you flying? He was unaccustomed to seeing such performance on his radar screen, and my rapid acceleration to high speed immediately caught his attention. The aircraft also took 3 minutes and 54 seconds to accelerate from Mach 0.98 at 35,000 feet to Mach 2.2, a remarkable feat. It was the Super Crusader's speed which forced the creation of its ventral fins, which were put in place to ensure stability at Mach 2+, as after all, directional stability of vertical tail surfaces decreases as Mach numbers increase. The downside was that these fins would increase drag, but this was easily overcome by the aircraft's immense engine. For landings, these fins would fold horizontal. One pilot said of them, the concept was great as was the performance. The other highly noticeable design feature, the huge intake which juts out from the F-8U-3 and gives it an almost joyous appearance, was designed so that the scoop would properly align the shockwave at high speed. The aircraft is more than just a rocket. The F-8U-3 was also maneuverable, and pilots continuously praised its handling. Donald L. Malik even called it excellent, and said it had light and comfortable control force, and there was no tendency to over-control or cause pilot-induced oscillation. The aircraft was also around 5,000 pounds lighter than its rival, and with a combat weight of 30,578 pounds and 26,000 pounds of thrust, this late 1950s aircraft would have achieved a respectable thrust-to-weight ratio. Beyond its high performance, however, the aircraft had several serious pragmatic advantages to the F-4H. It took up 20% less carrier deck stowage space, 30% less fuel permission, and was at least 10% cheaper than the Phantom to make and even cheaper to operate. With all this in mind, it can be difficult to understand why the f 8 u c was never a big success. However, the story of its development was rooted in a fierce competition between Vought and McDonald for the Navy's next fighter, a competition only one could win. Since its very inception, the F-8 U-3 was designed as an alternative to the F-4H program, which began in 1955 to provide the Navy a new carrier-based, all-weather, fighter-interceptor aircraft whose primary mission would be the interception of jet bombers attempting to strike U.S. aircraft carriers. While simultaneously running the F-4H program, the Navy reached out to Vought to develop an aircraft which would meet the same specifications and carry the same general equipment, and would then decide which aircraft best met the Navy's needs. From its onset, the Vought aircraft differed significantly in that it would rely on one engine, as opposed to the F-4H's two, and would also have less thrust overall. To offset this, it was immediately desirable the F-8U-3 be lighter. To make this so, the F-8U-3 would carry only three Sparrow missiles, as opposed to the F-4H's four, and would use a single-seat configuration. Both aircraft were to use the Sparrow missile as its primary armament for air-to-air -air engagement, and neither were to use guns. The outline of what would soon become the Super Crusader, the V-401, would be made similar to the F-8U-1 Crusader, but bulked up significantly. Performance proposals were sketched out for the aircraft, with a max speed of Mach 2.2 at 35,000 feet being put forward, a combat ceiling and afterburner of 55,000 feet, and acceleration from Mach 0.9 to Mach 2 was projected to take only three minutes. The ventral fins were integrated into the design, and in early December of 1956, the F-8U-3 mock-up was reviewed. It went forward largely without incident, though several changes were approved, going as follows. It was around this time that the airborne missile control system had been set forth with the designation Arrow X-1B and comprised the APQ-72 radar with a 24-inch dish, the APA-128 radar set, which to quote Tommy Thomason's superb book on the Super Crusader, consisted of the armament control computer and the continuous low-wave illuminator that guided the spare to the target and the projected display indicator, end quote. To aid in interception and generally decrease the workload of the single pilot, an autopilot system was also to be used on the Super Crusader.
On June 2nd, 1958, the Crusader III would finally take its first flight, only five days after its rival, the F-4H. Unfortunately, the flight would be cut short, a throttle jam occurred, and the aircraft suffered from severe buffeting. Still, test pilot John Conrad was impressed, stating, This aircraft is going to be a real weapon. It's got an ease of control and a sense of power that fighter pilots will like. Another thing is it's engineered so you can forget the little things and concentrate on clobbering your target. You've got everything it takes to really blap a target. This aircraft gives the pilot a whole new dimension. Still, and even beyond those encountered in the initial flight, the Super Crusader was having issues, the most pressing of which were its severe compressor stalls and excessive time to accelerate from Mach 0.9 to maximum speed. The compressor stall would result in the engine aggregating fuel, which would not be burned effectively until undisrupted airflow returned, whereupon it would burn all at once, causing a massive explosion that would shake the aircraft so significantly that it injured the second test pilot of the Crusader III, Joe Angelone, who compared it to dropping a couple of 500-pound bombs on a dive-bombing attack low enough to be dinged by my bomb shrapnel. The first F-8U-3 test pilot, John Conrad, described it like a 40mm shell exploding in the cockpit. The lack of acceleration was also a great concern, especially since it very much went against the expectations of Vought's engineers. In tandem with all these issues, however, the Super Crusader continued to perform well in many regards. Both test pilots spoke highly of it, with Joe Angelone saying of it, it had superb handling qualities, it was amazing at high Mach number, as we would typically throttle back at Mach 2 on our early test flights. We were limited by windshield and lower skin temperatures as high Mach numbers were explored." End quote. And in August, the F-8U-3 achieved speeds of Mach 2.2 at 43,000 feet, while still accelerating. Then, in September, a second F-8U-3 was built, which featured a larger tail and ventral fins which eliminated the buffeting issue encountered in the first flight, as well as using a slightly different engine. On the F-4H front, only minor issues had been encountered, until October 7th when an engine failure put the flyoff between the aircraft and hold. Commander Don Engine was able to fly both the F-4H and the F-8 U-3, having this to say about the F-4H. It flew like a truck. The stick's forces seemed inordinately high, particularly the elevator forces. But the two General Electric J-79 engines with afterburner were something else, made the aircraft a super performer and said of the F-8U-3, had the nicest flying qualities of any aircraft that I had flown to date, and it also was a super performer. End quote. Moreover, the Navy had identified several outstanding characteristics of the Super Crusader in general. During the break in the trials, Vought focused hard on correcting the faults of the Super Crusader. The acceleration issue was fixed when it was determined that the engine was being starved of air. The solution found itself in redirecting air for cooling purposes directly into the engine, while additional scoops on the aft fuselage would take care of cooling. Acceleration from Mach 0.9 to 1.4 at 35,000 feet had been around 3 minutes, with another 90 seconds to reach Mach 1.7. With the fixes, it now took half that time to reach Mach 1.4, and Mach 1.7 was reached in far less than 3 minutes. The compressor stall issue was never totally fixed, but it was improved so significantly that it was not overall of concern. Test pilot Robert Innes then had the opportunity to fly the improved Crusaders. He did not note any compressor stalls and said of the aircraft, In general, the satisfactory to good handling qualities of this airplane at high speed make it the most comfortable supersonic airplane the rider has yet flown. A formal Royal Navy pilot, Michael J. Lithgow, also had the opportunity to fly the aircraft, and was similarly impressed. It was noted too that with the changes the FAU-3 had pleasant approach and landing characteristics. Comparisons between the two aircraft continued, as pressure mounted for the Navy to make the decision on which aircraft to cancel. In coordination, George Spangenberg, Director of Bureau of Aeronautics Evaluation Division, prepared a comparative study. It was extensive, but generally stated the FAU industry had the edge in flying qualities, maintenance, operating costs, while also judging that it had superior maximum speed, superior supersonic rate of climb, and slightly better acceleration from Mach 1.5 to top speed. The F-4H had the advantage of armament load, multi-purpose capability, as well as having multiple engines and a two-man crew, in addition to a slight advantage on maximum altitude and supersonic rate of climb, subsonic rate of climb. One trait of fighters which was traditionally important for performance comparisons, maneuverability, remains largely absent. This was due to the perception that the plane's missions would not require significant maneuvering, and the aircraft auction during this time de-emphasizing the prospect of dogfighting. Nonetheless, the F-8 U-3 would have won in this field as well. From this, Benjenberg's conclusion read, From all the foregoing, it is apparent that a choice between these airplanes is fully as difficult today as it was a year ago. The F-8U-3 is not only the highest speed airplane yet produced for naval use, but is reported to be the best in overall flying qualities. The performance of the contractor in beating his time schedule for development and in correcting deficiencies as they appeared in flight tests has been outstanding. 
The F4H-1 development has been less spectacular, but its schedule has been met. Its performance is excellent and flying quality is satisfactory. The requirements decision made in 1955 that a two-seat airplane was necessary appears controlling. A single-seat airplane offered advantages in cost then, and does now. When funds are not limited, the multiple design approach has merit. In the actual circumstances, the total production rate possible is lower than is desirable for a single airplane. With but a single airplane to be procured, it is necessary to produce the, procure the design which can most nearly do all of the jobs which must be done all of the time. The greater effectiveness of the two-seat airplane in adverse conditions is decisive. Ultimately, it was the two factors that were inseparable from the F-8U-3, its one-man crew and its single engine, that resulted in the program's cancellation. It's worth noting that a one-man crew was a particularly significant issue at the time because the Sparrow missile required that the radar be pointed at its target. Therefore, a pilot would have to fly the aircraft and aim the radar simultaneously, though autopilot was implemented to assist in this. Were the F-8U-3 not to have been cancelled, several plans were made for the design. One plan was the F-8U-3F. The F-8U-3F would have been a rocket-propelled Super Crusader, featuring an 8,000-pound thrust rocket motor in the aircraft's tail. The rocket would burn H2O2 oxidizer, and was planned in particular to assist in rapidly accelerating to intercept enemy bombers, especially those at higher altitudes than the Crusader. A nonetheless developed but nonetheless exciting concept was the idea of a J-58 powered Mach 3 Super Crusader. The J-58 being the same engine that would go on to be used on the SR-71 Blackbird, the fastest aircraft in the world to date, and which produced 33,400 pounds of thrust at Mach 2 and 35,000 feet, as opposed to J-75's 24,450 pounds of thrust. It was projected that equipping the F-8 U-3 with such an engine would easily propel it to Mach 3 at 70,000 feet, if it didn't destroy itself in the process, and there Therein lies the issue. The plane would have had to undergo extensive modifications to withstand such intense speeds. In fact, it was theorized that the baseline F 8U 3 could go past its maximum speed. But at that point, the materials in the plane would begin to break down. In particular, it was a very real concern for pilots that the heat the aircraft would incur going well past Mach 2 would melt in their plexiglass windshield. This was an issue especially because unlike most other supersonic fighters, the F-8 U-3 lacked any kind of reinforced bulletproof glass in its cockpit. This made it so the Super Crusader could only breach Mach 2 for around 10 minutes, with a safer time being only 5. It seems likely this would have been changed for operational models, but there is no indicator either way. More pragmatically, upgrades were offered for the F-8 U-3 were to reach production in a two-phase program. The first phase would be implemented throughout 1960 through 1961, while well, the second would come in 1962 to 1964. Phase 1, as reported by Tommy Thomason, included the following improvements. Phase 2, also as reported by Tommy Thomason, included these changes. So, the F 8U 3 lost the contract, but there were still five aircraft built. What happened to them? The F 8U 3 would see service for NASA, a particularly good fit for space research because it could fly above 95% of the Earth's atmosphere, with a service ceiling of 51,500 feet. The aircraft's high performance also made it perfect for testing with sonic booms and the effects of different altitudes on them. Donald L. Malik stated that they did not use a chase plane on such missions because we had no other aircraft that matched the speed and altitude of the F 8U 3. Also, the scientists measuring the sonic boom over pressures did not want the interference of second aircraft that would alter the data. And for what it's worth, the Super Crusader also stacked up nicely against other contemporary aircraft, such as the F 104, which one pilot recalls the F 8U 3 consistently outran and outlasted. Another pilot recalls the F 8U 3 clearly outperformed the Grumman Tiger F 11F and the F 100C. Though less known, the F 8U 3 was the better fighter. It had great acceleration, speed, maneuverability, handling, climb rate, all fantastic characteristics, and subjectively did it while looking cool as well, taking an almost shark like appearance. It offered something different from the now ubiquitous F 4, a purebred fighter. In the end, to its detriment. Still, the Super Crusader is worth remembering is what the U.S. could have delivered as premier fighter, and a superb showcase of the peak of naval aircraft performance for its time. The Super Crusader was first flown by test pilot John Conrad in June of 1958. Later that summer, it would reach a blazing Mach 2.6, and in a final round of test flights late in the year, it remained the only competitor to the mighty F-4 Phantom. 
from a performance standpoint and an air-to-air -air combat standpoint, i.e. dogfighting standpoint, there was no comparison. The F-8U-3 would eat it alive. It was a much faster airplane and much more agile airplane than the F-4 was then or is now. Despite the impressive performance of the Super Crusader, the Navy opted for the twin-engine two-seater Phantom in December of 58. Following the Navy's decision, the F-8U-3 program was canceled, and all five aircraft were turned over to NASA for high-altitude, high-speed research.